You want to talk about vinegar? Let's I talk love about to talk about vinegar. Yeah. I'd also love you to just drop in as well how certain cultures have yes. had this within them as well. Because I think, give us the modern science, but give us the ancient wisdom as Let's well. Let's talk about the ancient wisdom first. So for centuries, there are countries around the world where vinegar has been consumed. I mean, I'm French, right? In France, we have vinaigrette on everything. Or in Iran, where making apple cider vinegar is sort of a tradition that people do in their home and they drink it every day. And in the 18th century, vinegar was even given as a tea to people with type 1 diabetes. And so we've known culturally for a while that this is a good thing to eat, but only recently we've discovered actually how it works. And to be perfectly transparent, when I was f when I first came across the vinegar stuff, I was like, this must be a fad. Like, I just, I just didn't believe it. I was like, this is another Instagram thing. I don't, but then I looked at the studies and they're actually incredible <laughs> clinical trials showing the impact of vinegar on our glucose levels. So now I'm a big vinegar fan. So let me explain. Who funded that study? Was it big, oh, I big, was it big, big vinegar? Big vinegar? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, legit scientists across the world. In Brazil, um, they, there was this one review study that was incredible. Um, it's all linked on my website and book if you want to check it out. But the science showed that one tablespoon of vinegar before a meal, so either as a dressing um, or in a drink, it can be water, it can be tea, reduces the glucose spike of that meal by up to 30% and reduces the insulin spike of that meal by up to 20% without changing what you're eating afterwards. Simply by adding this vinegar at the beginning of your meal, you can see an impact on your glucose levels. Now, of course, you know, I don't want people to think, oh, it's a magic pill. I'm just going to change nothing and just do the vinegar. The vinegar is one of several tools that become very useful in your day-to-day -day life. What I recommend in the, in the Glucose Goddess Method, in week two, we go over vinegar. Yeah, and I that's have, a whole week. That I saw it in the new week, book. And there's all these beautiful recipes and I made it really fun and gorgeous because people are like, oh, vinegar? Like what? I drink vinegar? That sounds gross. Don't worry. I have a lot of delicious mocktails. Well, and actually in you. the book, there was, yeah. there was this... Um, the, the photography is gorgeous in, in the new book. It really is. And there was one image... I can't remember what it was. It was in the vinegar section where it almost looks as though you're in a bar <laughs> having a cocktail, but actually it's vinegar, right? Yes. And I have, I made all these really gorgeous, delicious vinegar mocktails because why not create a little, you know, special occasion, a little ritual around having your vinegar once a day? Why not? Um, yeah, there's one, one of my favorite mocktails in the book is the mother apple spritzer. Yeah. And I thought apple cider vinegar is the most commonly used vinegar, but you can use any of them. And I thought, hey, you know, we don't often think about apple cider vinegar's mother, which are apples. So I wanted to make a mocktail that really, you know, helped apple shine. So anyway, that's a sidebar. You'll find it in the book. It's gorgeous. Vinegar before a meal, beautiful, simple impact on your glucose levels. There are even some pilot studies showing that by adding vinegar once a day, females with PCOS are able to reduce their testosterone without changing anything else about their diets. Yeah. I mean, this is profound. I mean... But isn't it crazy? It is. It's crazy. Well, what's crazy is that I mean, those numbers are frankly incredible, right? And what's also crazy is that this has been in cultures for a long time, for thousands of years. There's a lot of natural health proponents, naturopaths, um, nutritional therapists, mm -hmm. you know, who for many years will have been recommending apple cider vinegar. They would have said, you know, if you have some, you know, have that to blunt your blood sugar response. So I think there's been a lot of wisdom that's been out there, perhaps, you know, the modern scientific method has only just kind of explained and given the credibility to some people who need that. I actually really appreciate knowing how it works yeah. and seeing the data. Um, it's easier for me to adopt a new habit if I'm able to see the scientific study showing like, hey, this worked. But there's also other things that we can't do a scientific study about that I'm still going to do. You know, I'm not going to wait for people to say, I don't know, having friends is important for your blood sugar for me to do it. I mean, it makes sense that if you're happy, relaxed, emotionally connected, your blood sugar is going to be better, but I'm not going to wait for that study. Let's talk about vinegar then. So what does that practically look like? So let's say someone's going to have their lunch, right? And uh, it's a work do, right? So they can't really change too much about the content of what's in that lunch, yeah. but they're concerned based on what they've heard 
that it may spike their blood sugar and it may cause them a 3 p.m. crash, mm. needing more sugar and more coffee, right? So they've now heard about vinegar. So let's say their lunch meal is at 1 p.m., Yeah. right? Let's, you know, talk us through what you want them to do or at least consider doing with vinegar to blunt their sugar response. Before I answer that, I will say I also am often caught saying that you should only do the hacks when it's easy. So if it's too okay. stressful to organize a vinegar drink, don't do it. It's okay. But if you have vinegar accessible, let's say your lunch is at 1 p.m., I want you at 12.45 to go grab a tall glass of water. I could demonstrate I even have sparkling water here. A tall glass of water, sparkling water, any water, tea, whatever. One tablespoon of vinegar, proof in it. It can be apple cider vinegar. It can be white wine vinegar. It can be cherry vinegar, whatever. Just avoid the very syrupy balsamic glaze vinegar because that's more sugar than it is vinegar. And then um, you just drink it. So you can have it with a straw if you want to be extra cautious of protecting your teeth's enamel. But once it's diluted, it's usually fine. And then um, you just go have your lunch. That's about it. The ideal timing is to have this 10 minutes before you start eating. But you can also have it during or after the meal and it will also have an impact. Yeah, I, lo I love the way you just make it so practical that ideally it's 10 minutes, yeah. right? But hey, if it's 15 minutes before or five minutes before or during or after, you're still going to get exactly. a benefit. And I think that's so important because one thing I've experienced from trying to write books or trying to give uh, information to people to try and improve their lives is that sometimes it's 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 taken very literally. Oh, you said 15 minutes. And then that could create a stress that, Absolutely. oh man, it's 12.46. She told me to have it at 12.45. I've missed it. But it's not that. And I think that wider point as well is really, really important that, hey, listen, if you don't have anything around, don't worry about it. Exactly. It's when you can do them. Some Sundays I wake up and I want chocolate ice cream for breakfast and I'll just have it. No vinegar before, no veggies before, whatever. I'll just eat the ice cream that I want to eat. It's like what I want people to take away from all this is the science of the glucose hacks. But then doing the hacks and also not doing the hacks are both part of this new revolution yeah. you're using on your body and you're helping your health with. So it's not a diet. It's not restrictive. Just use it. Use the hacks when you can and the rest of the time live your life. Just by using one hack for, you know, once in a month is already better than not using it. Yeah. How often do you have chocolate ice cream on a Sunday morning? <laughs> Last time, I think it was probably six months ago. Six months ago. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't really happen very often, but, you know, it has happened. And I want people to know that when I want to, I do. Yeah. No, I love that. <laughs> I never thought I'd be talking to the glucose goddess, talking about having chocolate ice cream on a Sunday morning. You know, but I love that. I think people are going to really love that image. People have a misconception about me. They think that I never eat sugar and I never eat starches. I'm actually a huge sugar fan. I love sugar. I love pasta. I probably eat sugar every single day. So I'm not here to tell you to never eat it, eat it again. I'm not here to demonize it. I'm here to tell you, let's eat it. Maximum pleasure, minimal impact on our body. Because I don't want people to suffer. I don't want people to get diabetes. I want people to put diabetes into remission. I want people to get their period back. I want their mental health to be better, their skin to be clearer, to sleep better, etc. But also the cool thing about this science is that it, it allows us to do all that without giving up any of the foods that we love. Yeah. And that's so beautiful. And that's why in the Glucose Goddess Method, the, the new book, I teach you every week to put a hack in place in your life, like a gentle giant. Yeah. And the rest of the time, you do whatever you want. There's no restrictions at all. And it's incredibly powerful, as you see from the results. What I think so clever about it is that by making it feel achievable, it becomes very inclusive. Mm. People want to follow you. People want to do it. And they're going to feel so much better so quickly yeah. that it will lead to what I call a ripple effect, mm -hmm. that that one change is going to lead to a barrage of other positive changes, yes. right? So let's say, I know we can, and we're going to talk about movement in relation to blood sugar, but let's say just generalized movement. We know that moving more is typically a good thing and many of us are not moving enough, right? But a lot of the time people are not moving enough is because they feel rubbish and they're tired and they're sluggish. They've got no energy. So they're like, oh, I can't be bothered going to the gym. I can't be bothered going for a walk. Stabilize your blood sugars with these very gentle hacks. You're going to have more energy. Your memory is going to be better. Your brain's going to function more clearly. And then you're naturally going to actually 
move your body more, right? So you must, I'm sure you've had that experience from people in your community. Absolutely. And I think the the issue you described where somebody is just sluggish and doesn't want to do stuff, they're often met with the advice of just eat better and exercise more. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for a lot of people, that advice is too vague to even, you know, sort of start doing anything about it. It becomes overwhelming. It's like daunting. What do you mean eat better, more vegetables, exercise more? Like, I don't know. What I've solved, I believe, is a very important motivation issue. I've distilled the science down into these very simple Mm -hmm. things that are additive to your life. And as a result, you know, you put your foot in the, what's it called? The étrier in English, the thing on the horse, you know? You put your foot in the stirrup. Yes. You put your foot in the stirrup and then, you know, you ride the horse. And that first step is so freaking difficult. But with the hacks, it becomes very, very, very easy. Don't eat your carbs naked. (laughs) Okay, right. Let's talk about that because I think this is a really, really good hack. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll share with you what I did a few weeks ago with my kids. In a well, okay, this is this is not common, right? So, um, I guess like your Sunday morning uh, chocolate ice cream, this is not very common. But a few weeks ago, I cannot remember the exact ins and outs of what was going on, but I think it was just before dinner or at dinner time. There wasn't that much in the house. And there was some white rice. And I thought, I can't just have this white rice by itself. So I opened the cupboards and there was some nut butter. So I scooped in. (laughs) Exactly. This is not common. This is what my kids were seeing at the same time. And I wasn't tracking anything, right? But I I also know about stable blood sugars. And I thought, actually, come on. So I put in... um, Two or three big scoops of nut butter. I have so many questions. Right, okay. My kids do and they still tease me about it. And I had it. Now, I wasn't tracking anything. But the reason I did it, A, is because I know actually adding that to it is likely to slow down the sugar release. You put clothes on your carbs. And I happen to enjoy that, right? I haven't had it much, but I did enjoy it. So my question is, is it good? I I can have some quite unusual taste from time to time. I enjoyed it. I like white rice. I like nut butter. It's like Joey and Friends, you know? <laughs> Did you see that episode where they make like a, a pie, but it has meat in it, so it's sweet and meat. And he's like, I like meat. I like pie. Meat and pie together. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I, I haven't done it since. And the kids keep saying, Daddy, why did you do that? It's disgusting. I said, listen, taste is a subjective experience. Daddy actually really liked that. So they said, you're going to put that in one of your books? I said, look, I don't know. I'm not sure it's going to take off yet. But the principle, I think, relates very much Absolutely. to... I'm going to guess one of your most popular hacks. I don't know if it is, but, you know, that term naked carbs is quite provocative, right? What does it mean and why should you put clothes on your carbs? So let me ask you a question back. Why did you feel like you didn't want to eat the white rice on itself, by itself? Yeah, you know, the truth is I'm taking one isolated incident, right? And I don't want to put too much on it because I don't really do it. I, as a general rule at the moment, I'm trying to, um, I have been probably since I put my CGM on about three months ago for two weeks and I saw the impacts of certain things, I've not been wearing it, but I've just been making subtle tweaks, you know, like movement after exercise, uh, movement after eating, things like that, which we're going to talk about to stabilize blood sugar. Now, I was hungry as well. I was really hungry. And I thought, this white rice is going to go into my stomach. And about an hour later, I'm going to be starving again. Yes. Right? So that's why I did it. I'm not promoting it to people to be really clear. But that was my experience. So if I were in your situation and I was also faced with the white rice, I would think, okay, so starches, right? So rice, pasta, potatoes, things that are starchy. If I eat them on their own, because they're basically glucose molecules attached, they're going to create a big glucose spike. So if you eat pasta on its own, rice on its own, bread on its own, it's going to create a spike in your body. And then inflammation, glycation, aging, insulin, and then the crash. So cravings, hunger, et cetera. So I would think I need to put some clothing on them. And that's exactly what you did. So putting clothes on your carbs means that when you eat carbs, so starches, or sugars, you add protein, fat, or fiber to them. So you did exactly that. You put clothing on your carbs. As a result, you reduced the glucose spike of that food. And so it didn't change the fact that you were eating the food. And I'm glad that the nut butter plus rice even tasted delicious to you. You can borrow that recipe. I will, I think, actually cancel everything. We need to add a recipe into the new book. (laughs) (laughs) But by putting clothes on your carbs, you're able to 
steady the blood sugar and reduce the glucose spike of the meal. So let me give you some like common examples. So if you're going to have some pasta, for example, instead of having the pasta plain, maybe you throw in like a little bit of chicken in there, maybe a little bit of cheese, some olive oil, a few, I don't know, salad leaves like arugula or whatever, just to put some clothes on that pasta. If you're having rice, I think my, I would not go for the nut butter. I think I would go for like maybe some roasted cauliflower or broccoli and some tahini and I would just make a little, little. So, to be fair, if, if, if there was some <laughs> roasted broccoli or cauliflower tahini around, Perfect. I think I would have gone for that. Perfect. I don't think this was um, first choice. Let's put it like that. I feel you. <laughs> and then when it comes to sweet foods. So if I'm at a birthday party or I don't know, I want to have a cookie. I'll think, okay, are there any clothes I can add to it? So maybe with the slice of chocolate cake, I'll have a Greek yogurt. And actually that's one of my all-time favorite clothes on carbs combinations, chocolate cake and Greek yogurt together. Super, super good. Well, let's just go on that one because that's quite an interesting one. So you've tracked this on yourself, right? So what happens when you have the chocolate cake on an empty stomach by itself versus when you have the chocolate cake with Greek yogurt? Mm -hmm. So when your stomach is empty, and actually breakfast is also a good topic we should cover, but when your stomach is empty and you have sugar or starches, so if I had the chocolate cake on an empty stomach, the molecules in the cake would arrive in my stomach quickly and then make their way quickly to my bloodstream because there'd be nothing there to sort of slow them down or anything. So I would see a big glucose spike um, in my body. Mm. And that would lead to some consequences, notably kicking off a cravings roller coaster. So quick kicking off a glucose roller coaster all day that will lead to cravings, fatigue, craving, fatigue, craving, fatigue. So I don't really want to do that. I want to eat the cake, but I don't want the cravings roller coaster. So what I did is I added some Greek yogurt, which is proteins and fats. And I ate it at the same time as the chocolate cake. You can, if you want, have the yogurt before, which is more ideal for your glucose levels based on that food order thing. But to be honest, like Sometimes I don't want to do the food order, specifically with the chocolate cake situation. I want to have it with the yogurt. And as a result, combined to the glucose molecules in the cake, I'm also adding proteins and fats. And so when that little mixture arrives into my stomach, the glucose molecules are slowed down because there's other stuff going on there. Mm -hmm. There's the proteins and the fats. And so I'm eating the same cake, but the speed at which the glucose in the cake is arriving in my bloodstream is much slower. As a result, not a big spike, but rather sort of a moderate spike. Mm. And with that moderate spike, fewer consequences on glycation, mitochondria, insulin, and then less creation of that cravings roller coaster. And I want to touch on this point a bit more because we need to learn to eat sugar in a way that doesn't create that cravings roller coaster, which is also what a lot of people call sugar addiction. Yeah. You will hear a lot of people say, I'm addicted to sugar. And actually, if you look at it, it's very possible that they're creating that addiction by having, for example, on an empty stomach in the morning, first thing, something sweet or something starchy. And then if your breakfast is just starches and sugars, your entire day is going to be one big roller coaster and you're going to be controlled by these cravings all the time. If you enjoyed that short clip, I think you are really going to enjoy the full conversation, which you can check out here.